Hi everybody, it's Dave Remsen again at the Marine Biological Laboratory down at our Marine Resources Center and the dock here in Eel Pond and in Woods Hole. And today I thought we might talk a little bit about invasive alien species um, and the various types of invasive species that we have here in Woods Hole and uh, particularly right here on the dock. We'll take a look. And uh, <clears throat> first thing I want to do is tell you a little bit about what that term means, invasive alien species. This term refers to species of animals and plants, mostly is what we refer to, um, that are native to other parts of the world that have now become established here for a variety of reasons. Uh, some of them you're probably already familiar with. You might not even know that they're uh, not originally from here. And some of them uh, maybe you've never seen before, but we'll, we'll tell you a little bit about the ones that live right in our immediate area. Uh, alien species really refers to any species, plant, animal that originated someplace else which is now here. Invasive is a special addition to that term which means that when that animal has arrived here, or the plant, that it has had some kind of an impact. It has probably refers to the fact that it has uh, grown in numbers, it becomes abundant, and it typically means that it's displaced some, it's had some impact on our our local ecosystems, typically by displacing some or uh, many different species, sometimes to the point of reducing their numbers, uh, and even in some cases uh, causing some species to go extinct. Um, so when I was a kid here on the Cape, growing up in Woods Hole and Falmouth, one of our pastimes was to walk around the coastline, the Little Harbor, um, where there's lots of sm stones, and when the tide comes uh, goes down, uh, we would love to just walk around and turn over stones and just see what was under there. And one of the common uh, animals that we would find there were little green crabs. And green crabs, uh, as their name implies, are uh, relatively small to medium-sized crabs, commonly found uh, in, in our intertidal waters that are green. <coughs> and uh, I grew up uh, collecting those and uh, never knew that uh, actually those the green crabs themselves are an exotic, non-native alien species. They originated in Europe and um, came over probably on the bottom of ships, clinging to the ships as they, as they crossed over uh, from the Atlantic and established themselves here uh, quite a long time ago. In about the mid-80s, uh, first in the mid-Atlantic areas uh, like New Jersey and Delaware, a new crab started to appear in our shoreline and um, made its way north and we started seeing it here on the Cape in the in the 1990s and we call this animal the, uh, the Asian shore crab it's called Hemigrapsus sanguineus and it is now an abundant invasive alien species today we took a walk down to Stony Beach in Woods Hole and spent about five or ten minutes turning over rocks and this is what we found got a piece of kelp here to keep them damp, but I'm just going to lift up my hand and just show you this writhing handful of what are essentially young crabs, mostly small to medium sized crabs of this species. And I'm going to put a few just right here into this aquarium so you can take a look at them. And if you've ever walked our local beaches and turned over stones yourself, this is probably what you're going to find. These are the Asian shore crabs and they've become super abundant in our local waters. And what that abundance actually means, if we think about it for a moment, is that all of this biomass that you're looking at, and what I mean by biomass is simply the accumulated mass, the weight, the volume of what is now all of these crabs. Uh, if we roll the clock back to when I was a kid and there were none of these here, all of that equivalent biomass was probably something else. There's only a certain amount of energy budget that goes into our local waters that is used to produce biodiversity. And when I see all of this biomass of crabs, that means those crabs have been taking food and turning it into their own bodies at the expense of something else. And one of those something else is that seems to have fallen uh, victim actually to, uh, to being displaced by this species of crab is our even our local green crab. We still have them in abundance, but they typically have moved into slightly deeper water um, so that they're not competing directly with this species. There are times uh, of the year when you can go to places along our shoreline where there are flat rocks in the intertidal zone and you can turn over a rock the size of a dinner plate and there could easily be 20 or 30 of these crabs sitting uh, under there waiting for the tide to come back in where they will go out and forage again. 
These are quite small. The biggest ones might have a shell no more than an inch, inch and a half in, in width. Um, but what they make, what they lack in size, they make up for in abundance. And um, it is believed that this species probably came into our waters through some kind of uh, cargo <coughs> shipping route. <coughs> it is not uncommon for ships that are traversing the oceans carrying cargo, particularly liquid cargo, such as oil tankers, fuel tankers, tankers that carry uh, um, any kind of liquid in bulk, they will do so by filling large tanks with that, with that material. When they drop that material off at their port of, of, of uh, delivery, they typically have to fill up with seawater in order to keep heavy enough to, to return back to get a new fill up and they fill their ballast tanks up with local water, essentially taking a sample of the plankton that lives in those waters and transferring it someplace else where they dump that water out before they load up with whatever it is they're going to be carrying. And so this ballast water transport system has been responsible for providing um, access to many invasive species all over the world. And unfortunately, uh, here in Woods Hole, this species is not the only non-native species we find in our local waters. And by the way, <clears throat> you're probably familiar with invasive terrestrial animals and plants um, that probably have an impact maybe even your own backyard. You might be familiar with gypsy moths and more recently now we have a moth called the winter moth which, uh, which you will typically find flying around and gathering your, on your porch lights in November and December, hence the name. Uh, almost all the plants that you'll find growing along the roadsides on the main roads uh, here on the Cape that will predominantly be non-native plants. Um, Japanese knotweed, garlic mustard, um, there's a whole range of species which take advantage of habitat that has been disturbed by people, roadsides, uh, facilities like this dock here in Eel Pond where there's a lot of boat traffic such that um, we have a stressed ecosystem where local animals are not as abundant and provide opportunities for non-native animals to move in. So we've gone down to the dock and I lifted up some uh, floats and I pulled a few animals off that all represent uh, um, non-native uh, alien invasive species. Uh, they actually all belong to a single, a, a single group of organisms that are called sea squirts or ascidians. And, uh, Sea squirts come in, in two varieties. There's solitary ascidians and there's colonial ascidians. And they are all um, members of a phylum. If you know a basic introduction to the tree of life, the major branches of the tree of life are the kingdoms that include the animals. And then the subdivisions of that are the phyla. And we, human beings, are what are uh, called uh, chordates. We have a backbone. And believe it or not, the animals that I'm about to show you are the closest relatives that we have in the animal kingdom that are invertebrates and uh, 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 are invertebrates but are most closely related to animals with a central nervous system and a spine. The first one I want to show you, I'm going to take it out of the water and I want to assure you that this animal can survive out of the water no problem. There's two of them and this is a large solitary ascidian called Styliclava, the stalked sea squirt. And you can see where it gets its name because it's a long animal with a big stalk that is attached normally to the, in this case, the bottom of our dock. It is not uncommon in the fall for marinas around town to be pulling their floats and their small docks, sections, and boats out of the water. And if you're not careful about treating your boat with some kind of anti-fouling compound, it's quite possible that you'll find the bottom of a boat or a dock covered with these stalked sea squirts. These animals originated in the Western Pacific and uh, have been around uh, the Cape since at least the 60s or the 70s. I don't quite when they showed up. Um, they get their name sea squirts, of course, if, uh, if I give them a gentle squeeze, if they're not holding themselves too, together, too tightly held, they will uh, squirt a little water out of their siphons. They feed by opening up a pair of siphons at the top, <clears throat> filtering out the water, and uh, trapping any nutrients, plankton, and small organic particles, and feeding on them. And there's uh, plenty of that here in Eel Pond, and Styla clava is not an uncommon uh, animal in our waters. One thing I'd like to point out is that this animal itself serves as a base for many other animals to colonize it. Throughout the year in all of our coastal waters 
with varying degrees of intensity, we have a constant supply of living animals in the plankton floating around in our waters. And many of them are young animals looking for a place to live, to attach. And that includes all of the larvae of these ascidians I'm about to show you. And when they come across a bare patch, be it a non-native species or a local species looking for a place to live, they attach and they'll start to grow. So let's take a look at some of the other specimens I've collected. The first one we're going to talk about is one of our colonial sea squirts. This one's called Botrylis, or the Golden Star Tunicate. And what you're looking at are a series of animals that are arranged in a circle. Each one of the little circles that you see here actually represents anywhere from a dozen to maybe 18 individuals that started off as a single fertilized embryo that hatched out as a little swimming larva, looks like a tadpole, that attached itself to the side of the dock or to a small piece of seaweed or even a piece of rope and it started to grow. It turned into a little sea squirt looking like a mini version, a little bit of the styla that I showed you a moment ago. And as it grew, rather than getting larger and larger like a solitary sea squirt, this animal gets to a certain size and then it divides itself into two and it clones itself into two individuals. And as they're growing, they continue to divide and they form a little circle of individuals and they're all sucking in water through their siphons they're filtering out and growing and they're exhaling that filtered water through the center part of that circle and over time these individuals and circles start to grow and they form these mats and this particular species the golden star tunicate can be golden as its name indicates they come in a whole range of colors they can be bright green they can be gold they can be sort of a bluish color they can be an orange um, and they're quite common here let's take a look at the second species here now that is a bright orange species which is a little different and this one's called botryloides and botryloides first showed up here in about in, in the in the late 70s and again this is a colonial uh, tunicate well, I will use the words tunicate, sea squirt, and ascidian, all to mean the same thing. These are different words for the same group of animals. Um, like the golden star tunicate, this animal starts off as a small orange tadpole-like animal. It attaches itself to the dock, if you're unlucky, to the bottom of your boat, and it starts to grow and it starts to form these rubbery orange mats. And the reason they're a little bit of a problem at, in terms of an invasive alien species is they tend to overwhelm and cover barnacles, mollusks, and other animals, native animals that are living here and essentially smothering them. Let's take a look at another, I'm gonna reach in and grab this one. This is a more recent arrival. This is a prickly kind of translucent white sea squirt from Europe, it's called the Cityella, the rough sea squirt. And it, start, it showed up in our waters in around the early 90s and uh, probably came over in the ballast water of some kind of a cargo ship transporting materials, could have been sitting on the bottom of a ship. Like all these sea squirts, they broadcast their eggs, fertilized eggs out into the water column. Those eggs hatch out into little tadpole-like uh, larvae that attach themselves, and if they attach themselves to a ship, that ship goes someplace else and seeds new areas. And so this is also another common inhabitant of our docks and pilings. So the kind of things that make animals like this invasive are the ability to withstand um, lots of different temperature regimes, to be very general in the things that they require to eat so that wherever they land they can feed, and to typically they they are very fecund. They produce lots and lots of babies on the hope that some of them will land someplace they can grow. And they, they're very good at taking over areas that other animals are not occupying particularly well, which makes invasive species as a whole able to occupy places that are disturbed by humans, such as docks and marinas like Eel Pond, where there's a lot of human activity, like roadsides, like open fields that have been cleared, etc. So we're going to talk next time about how some of these traits and features that make these animals invasive also allow biologists here at the MBL to answer and address other questions that might be more relevant to our own interest in biology using these animals as, as models for research. Mm -hmm.